Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, inviting you to join in in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music world. Today, my special guest, and I'm super honored because he's a longtime friend and now a colleague, actually, uh, actually studied with Chet. And I'll tell you more about that later. But please help me, help, help me welcome Chet Tobo. Thank you so much for, for joining me today on this Shaping Your Journey conversation. Uh, it's my pleasure to say the least. Good to yeah. see you. Before we, uh, before we talk about you know, Shaping Your Journey and the things that we go through, the decisions we make through our whole career that take us where we are, uh, today and you know and at any and at any point during our lifetime in our kind of career, uh, what where did this all begin for you? Like just that moment where it began that first spark. Let's start with that before going through the decision process and all of that business. Where did it start for you? That first spark. Well, um, my mom's brothers all played musical instruments and stored in the attic of our house were those instruments and um, there was a violin and had no strings but I found that if you turn that thing upside down and you play Wipeout and this was before Wipeout was ever recorded by the way um, yeah so that's where it started on a violin um, needless to say, that violin is no more. It's, I, I totally <laughs> destroyed it. But I had a lot of fun. Um, and then there were some drums, um, of my Uncle Wally's. He was a drummer. A typical story that you hear over and over again. You know, there's somebody in the family that plays and, and, um, I messed around with them and, um, that was, I, I love that. I love the drums. Um, I had hearing issues, so I was uh, in elementary school, I played saxophone. But that violin was still there for me, if you know what I'm saying. And I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Now, I heard, I've heard a lot of violin stories. Like Joe Morello was originally a violinist uh, and a whole other number of people, but you uh, you put a whole other spin to the violin playing for me today. <laughs> but that's good. I mean, if something can be an inspiration, why not? It's a good thing it wasn't somebody's Stradivarius, though. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> did you, You're did you, uh, yeah. No, after, after that, did you go to a music school and, and play in school bands? Was that like the trajectory you took? Um, I played saxophone. My, my uncle Chet, um, was a really good musician in the, I guess, late thirties, forties. Um, he was shot down in world war two. And, um, I was it so happened. I was, I was supposed to be Joseph and, um, I was born on his birthday. Wow. So hence I am, uh, my, I have, um, I'm his namesake and I, and I walk with that very proudly. And, um, so as far as, um, inspiration, my brother, Lou, five years older than me, um, at a very young age, he was about four years old and, um, he loved had the shiny saxophone. So he started playing the saxophone, my mother sat in on his lessons, uh, sat with him every day practicing, and he was truly gifted. And um, so having him as uh, uh, an older brother, um, inspirational, really talented, uh, was something in the house all the time. Uh, as we got older, he controlled the record player. <laughs> So he would play all this, these hip, uh, you know, Oscar Peterson and, you know, all the things that, you know, I really had no interest in, but I had to listen to it. And, and the stuff grew on me. And um, 
I was very fortunate that, you know, he was um, a key uh, person in my life, as well as, you know, my parents were very loving, very supportive as a per parenting concept. Their concept, they never said this, but their concept basically was, we give you guys a gift of life. What you do with it, it's a gift. You know, it sounds a little bit like uh, Ala Tunji, right? Right, you know, with, right, right. With sayings. But, uh, and truly, as we grew older, you know, Lou was a, became a professional musician, and certainly I did too. And, um, you know, the you know, especially, you know, we grew up in the early 60s, well, through the 60s. And at that time, what was very common is uh, parents would want um, their kids to get a good job, you know, and you'll be set for life, you know, and we never got that from, from, from my parents, you know, they, they love music. They love seeing us uh, be happy. And, um, and uh, so right there, I was really blessed, um, you know, to have them, to have that environment. Sure, sure. That makes it makes a big difference when you're not get when you don't get pushed into something, and then that old uh, paradigm of uh, you're set for life. I mean, we we all know that that's a fallacy, of course. And and I mean, I used to work for some things, but today uh, it it doesn't work, which is maybe a good thing. You know, then we we're more liberated to to do the things we love to do. We're really good at, so we can be most helpful in the best situation, right? especially as musicians, when we go that route, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. When did you start playing drums? Now, you, you played these other instruments before, but when, when was that moment that you switched? Well, um, played saxophone through elementary school. Sixth grade, I'm on the stairs of my elementary school with my band teacher, begging him to let me switch to drums and got the old story. We have too many drummers, right? How many times do you hear that? Oh, I have one so, of those. <laughs> with that, uh, my brother was in college, I guess, by then. And he was playing with really good musicians and he was playing with this really good drummer. And um, I, my family hooked me up with uh, this drummer's teacher. This guy was, uh, his name was Rod Johnston, bless his soul. He was um, a, a true hero in the service, um, major battles on PT boats. I mean, he was just a real Marine. And um, he uh, taught me the whole rudimental drumming, all the rudiments and was our lessons. Uh, my folks had got me some drums. Uh, first lesson, he says to my parents, got to take Chester's drums and put them up in the attic. And if you do that, I'll teach them. So for a whole year, I'm on a drum pad. I had to stand, stand in front of him the whole lesson, like I was in the Marine Corps. You know, he'd, wow. he'd be just sitting there, you know, sucking on a candy, writing something, and, and I'd be standing there. But for whatever reason, I, I was I, I wanted that drum set to come downstairs, you know. So I did whatever he did, and, and it was a real blessing to have him um, just, you know, get that technique. And uh, he was really a nice man. Now, so that's, that's about where the, uh... I guess the switch came. And then, you know, what's a common thread with your uh, your different uh, uh, conversations with people is uh, that, you know, you bump into people, you know, no coincidences, right? I don't and, believe in uh, coincidences yeah, and you know I, that. I had a friend <laughs> yeah. that was in a drum and bugle corps and, uh, you know, he recruited me. I love that, you know, just the, uh, the camaraderie and I got the drum, you know, you, 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 where else, you know, could I really, you know, bang on stuff, you know, and, and uh, it was just a really cool thing. So I just kept, that was the trajectory that was started for me. 
And just just thinking yeah. about the uh, the idea of of you practicing on a on a pad for years, and that was the, the old school idea of that's how you play drums. And Joe Morello went through the same thing. And and I remember when he came to Cosa a number of times, and we had these discussions. What's what's your um, thought about that? That you should stay on a pad for a long time, or immediately on the drum set and you do some pad. Yeah, it's funny you should bring that up because um, when I started teaching, you know, very often you teach the way you were taught. So when I first started teaching, uh, very green as a teacher and um, teaching beginners. And I found out really quickly that um, I had a very unique situation when I was a kid and um and maybe I didn't have the skill to really sell that. Um, but for whatever reason, I found that this isn't working. So at that point, um, I made adjustments. And, and again, you know, with my brother, I was playing with him and, um, in my late teens. And um, he was playing with great musicians. So, um, you know, I got a lot of... Um, good advice and direction and, um, uh, you know, they really kind of uh, really helped my concept uh, of, of, uh, of teaching, you know, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I just came from this one dimension and they opened up the world to me. Right. And you were teaching at, uh, uh, I mean, you were teaching, you were in, in Long Island, right? Uh, yeah, I'm on Long Island, yeah. Right, and then you you taught at uh, it in Manhattan at the uh, at the um, Drummers Collective, right? Yeah, I wound up. You know, um, funny story is that um, my good friend of mine, Frank Marino, he's a New York drummer, good jazz drummer. I don't know if you know him, um, but uh, we wound up going to these. Uh, sessions that Sam Yolano, God rest his soul, he'd run these, I, these I, I, jam I studied, sessions, you know. And, yeah, I studied and, uh, with Sam. That guy yeah. was doing everything. He was very inspirational in that. He was just nonstop, correct? Yeah, I studied with Sam. I know what you mean. <laughs> and I still yeah. have the metal sticks. <laughs> ah, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so... We would go in, and at the time, I wrote the uh, Funk Drumming Workbook, which um, at that time, uh, it was kind of unique, uh, that topic, and uh, the book was very successful and popular, whatever. So he, um, I guess Rick Kravitz, who was the original owner of the Drummers Collective, was looking for someone to teach the contemporary drum set uh, class, and... Um, Voila, Sam rec recommended me, and I wound up uh, teaching there, I guess, two years. And, um, you know, uh, it, was, it was a really great experience. You know, just um, uh, something to share that, you know, um, I've always been a very shy person, Um Going into the New York City was a big thing for me. It's not like I'm one of these guys that would fly down from Canada. You know what I'm saying? You know anybody <laughs> like that? Oh, I yeah. I certainly do. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you right there just for a second, and I'm gonna interject. So, what I used to do uh, as when I was uh, studying at McGill in Montreal, every month I was studying classical percussion and jazz. I was doing a double degree, and so I was doing it all. But the drum set players I wanted to study with were all in New York, and the you know the Cuban guys, Frank Malaby, and all of these people. And so I would I went to Drummers Collective every month. I would save all my money, and I mean all my money. I'd fly down to New York, stay there, and, and study with whoever I could. And uh, in the seventies, wow. you were one of them. I oh still have God. your book, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did so, you get to study with Frankie Malibay? Ah, uh, yes. I studied with Frank Malibay. I studied with Gene Golden. I studied with uh, uh, Walden. I studied with so many people 
in, in New York, at both at the collective and uh, I would just seek people out on specific things. And I, and you know, it was crazy, it was a crazy time because I got to know a lot of people at that time in, in New York. I was almost a local because during the summers I would go to all these camps and all the guys eventually from the Jamie Abersold camps to marimba camps to uh, the National Stage Band camps. So all of these guys eventually were ending up in New York. So I'd show up to a place to see Thad Jones Mel Lewis band and the whole band were people I played with. So it was, they're asking me, oh, so Aldo, you're in New York. Uh, yes, for three days, but <laughs> that, that went on for years. And in fact, uh, you know, I st hung out with Steve Gadd. He used to invite me to all his sessions. Uh, Alan Schwartzberg. I mean, all the guys would just uh, treat me as, as, a, as one of them. And I would be just a fly on the wall and learning and seeking, you know, just... So by the time I, I spent a few years doing that and getting my degree, then I just, I, I was like a rocket. I just, you couldn't stop me. <laughs> you know, but, but you were one of them, Chet. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm honored. And, you know, um, I wish I was more like you. You know, like I had alluded to, you know, I'm, uh, I'm um, kind of timid. You know, I never took mass transit in two years uh, going into the city. I drove in. Uh, I just um, have, I guess, I wouldn't call them phobias, but just the, I, I didn't feel comfortable. Okay. And um, boy, I wish I was more like you. You know, for me, it was more records where I, I got my information. And um, I did manage um, to go in with Bernard Purdy for about a year. Yeah. Which was a very interesting experience. <laughs> and I, I also I, studied, I studied with him. Time with him. Yes, yes. And, and the nice thing with, with Bernard was I would have lessons with him just before he would go to a session. So we'd go before the session, have my, my lesson, and then I would stay and watch the, the recording, you know. And, yeah. and it, was, it was funny because I'd be in the studio, I'd be in the drum booth, we'd do the lesson, and I'm listening to the drums. And by now I'm starting to, to do my own work in Montreal. I was starting to do all the work that... I was headed for, you know, the studio work and playing with major artists, et cetera. And then the beginning of repercussion at this at that time. And I'd be listening to the drums, and they just sounded awful. And I'm saying, I hope he tunes these drums before the session. I'm saying to myself, right? Because <laughs> I sounded yeah. awful on them. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the lesson would be over, it would be great. I had enough material to, to work with for a long time. I'm sitting in the in the control room, they're recording. And he sounds like a million dollars. And I'm saying, how does he do that? <laughs> it was always a mystery for me for a while. You know. <laughs> well, you know, when I went to him, um, I had my funk drumming workbook um, out. And um, he was really cool about it. And um, he was known for teaching out of the Haskell Harbuck. I don't know if you, he ever took you through that. No. And for those people that might not know, it's a very, it's like a, a, a beginning band method for, let's say, concert band kind of um, uh, performance. And, but he would interpret those, uh, those pages a, a lot like way, the way people would do with Ted Reed syncopation but more like chart reading kind of stuff. And, okay. you know, as proficient as I might have been with notation, the idea of reading charts wasn't, you know, one of my strong suits. So I was going to him for that. And he, he like blew me off. He says, you know, you don't need to do that. You got that down. And meanwhile, I, know I didn't really speak up, but I'm, meanwhile, I'm going, well, okay, um, uh, he's a master, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and then I'm going, well, he's going to throw something better at me, right? So this is going to be, be cool. But we spent most of the time just talking, many times, uh, mainly him, um, and it was all cool. And every once in a while, he would play on his drum set, and... Um, he never had the snares on. I don't know if if you yeah. had that. 
he wouldn't put the yeah. snares on. And if, and if you were going to play on his set, you, no, 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 don't put your snares on. And, um, and you know, what I got out of the lessons weren't really what people would think, you know, what a drum lesson is. But just being around him, hearing him pick up the phone and, you know, on the other end and saying, you know, how you doing, Bernard? And he'd go, pretty good, you know, was worth a million bucks. You know, <laughs> he was just really fun. Yeah. And um, when he played, and, and this is what I really got out of that experience, when he played, it just felt so great. It was just you know that was the message. You know, you 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 make sounds that create a feeling, and you have to feel it. And when you feel it, other people feel it. And boy, did I feel because I'm in this little cubicle of a room, and it's just me and him. He's playing for me. You know, maybe more for himself, but I thought he was playing for me, and he just played his ass off. It was just. It was just a, a, a great experience and totally not what I expected, you know, and he's a great guy, you know, as I'm sure, you know, when you bump into him, he, you know, he, you know, he's just fun to, you know, just to catch up with him. Oh, yeah. yeah. And no, he's no, still he's, going strong. Yeah, yeah. No, no, he's great. And he's he's been at COSA a number of times, so we've become really good friends. And But the one thing that, I mean, there are a couple of things that I really learned that stuck with me with him was how he used when he, he'd always he'd play often cross stick right and the way he manipulated his fingers on yes. on, the, on the drum on the snare yeah. drum and you know at first i'm saying i'm hearing something but what i see is not what i hear and the way he would manipulate those sounds with his other fingers at the intensities and the way he would bring it in and interpret those little notes these these grace notes with his fingers it's fascinating, and it may not come up, uh, may not be so strong on a situation, on a live situation, but in recording, it's incredible, incredible. If you, you know, if one takes the time to to experiment with that, and and I, and I and I certainly did because I thought that was amazing that he could do that. Just all these ghosting notes, but different levels of ghosting notes. So give it, he gave the the that feel so much dimension. And then, of course, his whole concept of feel was he would talk a lot, of course, in my lessons, but it was really about the feel, like what it was. And, we, you know, he would talk about it and I would listen. And one of his uh, favorite expressions, which I, because I used to record the, the, the lessons and I, every once in a while I'll listen to it, but it, one that st stuck in my mind was you play like that and you think like that and you be a bad motorcycle. <laughs> a bad motorcycle and yeah. I, I, I mean you you know yes and that that was his whole thing is like that feel that group that interpretation which you know it takes i think any of us a long time to really understand to what that really means you know we talk about feel but now at the level that after after having played for so long we totally get it and we've we've been through all those variations, those different scenarios, what that really means. But you know, ha after having studied, for example, a lot of African drumming, a lot of this world music, that all of a sudden it's about that feel where those notes are played within the the pulse, and and understanding that the the whole African approach to playing, which you, everything is bendable as long as the the pulse is there. <laughs> so, and guys like him and Gad too. I mean, uh, have that uh, down so much. And then you have you know people like Mark Giuliano who's taken that whole feel, uh, and, and it feels like a you know Hawaiian wave, and it's fantastic. Be able to be able to to move with it because it, it's not a Swiss watch. Not and, and so getting back to Bernard, he's all about the feel and what he did. And he didn't show a lot of chops, a lot of you know, those big fills and, and and impressive stuff. And I was never into that any, anyway. But just what he did, like Ringo Starr, fit so well. I mean, it was like those notes that he played cannot be any other notes for that music. So that was a big yeah. lesson for me. 
you know. Yeah. Well, just back to Bernard a second. You know, he um, I he he made me wonder about um this this X factor, you know, um, was it something, you know, I think there's just something there, the way he's put together and feels music, feels drumming, rhythmic performance. And, and I think through a lot of experience of playing, it just, he just built upon that. But I, you know, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I it, it's, there's something there, you know, that, that I don't have, you know, and I went to him because I wanted some of that. I wanted to, to play more feelingful, you know, and, and, you know, what's the secret? And when I would ask him any questions rel relative to whatever, he says, well, you'll know it when you know it. That was the thing that I, that I, you know, if you ask them any kind of questions, you know, and um, and in a way, it, it's a beautiful thing because what I learned from him, from that experience, and just studying the world of drumming is that um, we're all different. And, you know, in a way, you wanted to play like this guy or that guy and and really, you take it all in. You know, you've said this many times. Uh, you take it all in and, and you really find your own voice. And hopefully it's something genuine. And you're really blessed if somehow you can do something that um, that's, you know, different. If you're, let's say, somebody like Steve Gadd, who redefines a, you know, uh, a, a genre in a way, or Tony Williams, or or Elvin, or you know, I, there are so many people that that they, or Garibaldi. I can't leave him out. And yeah. and you know, the way that they play it makes so many people aspire to. Hey, I want to play like that. And um, you know, if you're really trying to be a artist, um, you really need to spend time copying people but some somewhere along the line you have to kind of throw it away and you know create who you are to be genuine yeah i know and that's well said i i think you know in all my not just the conversations I've, I've been having with all our friends but in my own experience and watching other people how did they achieve or arrive at, at a certain thing well, it became obvious. I mean, like you said it earlier, you played along with records a lot. So a lot of us did that. And I think that that really helps. If you're not playing live every night with the band all your life, well, the other thing you do is you listen to records and you play with all those people on the records to learn what repertoire, like drum repertoire and how structures work, how, you know, how they come up, how they introduce a new section, how things work and then we steal some of those ideas and we incorporate them in our own language but then at some point when you're the on the other side and you're creating and you're playing uh -huh. and you you cannot be any other voice you you have all of these words that everybody uses but they will always come out from where you're from i mean i'm calabrese i, I was I was nine years old when I moved to another country and I speak four languages. So every inflection that I have is going to be reflected in, in the language I use. And I, I could say the same words as you, and I'm never going to sound like you no matter how much I try. But I can say the same words, and I see them from a different angle. Now, like what you just said, when if you want to get down to something that has called your voice or your style or whatever we want to call it, you're, you're absolutely right. You have to spend a great deal of time then going down, straight down, and going deep, in other words. And, and Jamie Haddad said, said this uh, once when he was at COSA, and we actually had it, did that for uh, the, the master lessons that we filmed, the 
master 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 lessons no lessons with the masters it was called at cosa and he said one thing that i thought was super super interesting he says you don't need a lot of a lot of things once you've made the rounds and have kind of an idea of repertoire playing this style and that style playing like him like her all of that then he said you got to learn one rhythm and and make it yours and that's what's going to make it and i thought that was interesting one rhythm one thing so what for example you and i would say okay steve gad well steve gad always does the same thing you know what i mean he doesn't but he's known for that one thing but that's his starting point of course he's done classical he's he even played timpani on a Chuck Mangione album with uh, with orchestra when he was a student at, at Eastman he went on to be a jazz player up a funk player up all of the above but his drum corps stuff really comes out and what he did with that that one thing just expanded changed the world case in point right yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I used to say something similar about Buddy Rich, having seen him live many times. Um, you know, he would, his solos, you know, he'd have his bag of tricks. You know, he'd have the, the thing with the singles and he'd bring it up on the rim and then, you know, it could come up and yes. then he'd have the thing where he could tickle the cymbals, you know. Um, uh, so he had these, um, and then the, the crossovers, you know, which. Right. Other people do them, but there's nothing like seeing him do them. And um, so, you know, it, in a way, you know, some of these guys, uh, it's not just a thing, you know, they, but conceptually, I totally agree with you. They take something and they run with it and then maybe they do something else and they run with that, you know, and, and um, so consequently what happens is that they have a lot of diversity as far as what they can really do on a very high level and uh, and in a creative way in their voice. You know, it's like, and that's, you know, to me, you know, that's something, I mean, there's a lot of great drummers um, that we know their names and don't know their names that we don't even know, we don't even know they exist even, right? But, you know, the guys that, that we're exposed to that, um have that x x factor that there's something just really exceptionally unique you know that that makes them special you know and it's actually there's a lot of those guys but we all have our top five favorites so i know you're prepared this who are your top five favorites <laughs> I, I, i'm not, i'm always prepared but never prepared i mean that's a good question uh, chat Wow, that's a good yeah. one. That's a good one because um, can I qualify I've been a... the, the question? Is that okay? Sure, sure. Five that have really unique voices that you connect with. That's a good question, right? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I mean, I was if I'm going to answer either version of that question, um, I'm going to say because I. I listened to a lot and I, I just worked <laughs> my butt off a lot and I explored a lot in all of the areas. I don't, I blur the lines in all the styles and I, I'm equally uh, comfortable in classical music as in, in, in world music and, and drum set and whatever and wrote a book on Cuban music and spent three years on that. But the people, uh, so I've had, consequently I had a chance <laughs> to listen to a lot of different people. So... Um, let me see. People who would, who created something that would, that influenced my, not just my respect, but my way of thinking of what is important in the drumming. Yeah. And I'll, I'll rephrase your, your question a little bit, just so that I'm comfortable with my response, because those are the people that uh, s spoke to me as far as that's, that makes sense. And I'm always still exploring, you know, we never really finished that, that job, you know, we never really finished that, that uh, mission. So, you know, beginning guys like Ringo Starr, of course, Buddy Rich, and I watched Buddy Rich a million times, uh, 
you know, we knew each other well. We even up with repercussion, we opened up for him once and he was just, he was standing there the whole time. And I got to know him really well. He actually gave me his cases, his drum cases at one point. Wow. <laughs> which which I used you know, as my the cartridge company used, it took my drums to a recording at one point. And I just used those cases. So when I showed up, everybody's standing around the cases, and it says "Buddy Rich, the world's greatest drummer" on them, right? And I show up, so they look at me and they say, <laughs> "Oh, it's you." <laughs> so I said, "Well, those cases are going to go in a museum." That was I set myself up because they thought. Don't tell me we, this session is going to be with Buddy Rich and I show up. <laughs> so, you know, he, he did a lot for, the, uh, for me, for the world of, of drumming, of course. So those are two. Then you have, I have, you know, Dino Danelli was a big one for me in, in The Rascals. Uh, Steve Gadd, of course. Yeah. And, and uh, a drummer in Cuba, uh, Geraldo Piloto, who is probably, I mean, Cuba's top drummer and musician. He's a composer. He has a group called Climax with a K. And he's an incredible musician. Not too many people know him outside of Cuba. But he's yeah. like the Phil Collins, Steve Gadd, like everything in one, plus the whole Cuban history. Um, and he's, he's a force. And he's recorded so many albums. He's like behind that whole machine down there. And he's, and he's one of the people who's developed this whole style of timba, which came, you know, after Songo, the, the next big one was this timba playing, which is a, you know, other mixtures of funk and, and Cuban and, and all of this. Uh, he's kind of a, the other changuito, you know. So if you were to limit it to five, I would say that, that's it. But there are so many others, you know, Garibaldi, of course. I, I, I mean, I... Yeah. Everyone has one thing that I, I really, so of course, these are things that I am not great at, but I enjoy exploring and trying to get better at <laughs> all the time. You know, the, the whole shuffle thing, the, the Bernard, per, the Purdy shuffle idea, uh, you know, the linear drumming that, that Garibaldi has, has created. And, and I think everybody influences everybody all the time and i think that's a good thing you know so i don't know if that answers your question but that's if, if you, you caught me on the uh, uh unprepared but i think i know my answer that's a good list what about you what's that what about you which would be your five uh well, the difficulty, as you just encountered, is uh, you know how do you whittle it down to five people, right? Um, yes. But I would say, um, I, I I could go with your list. You know, I, that's um, uh, you know it's it, it's a very personal thing too, right? Of course, of course. You know uh, how you know you you view uniqueness and you know somebody that's really changing. You know, I would I would somehow try to sneak in Elvin Elvin oh, Jones for sure. Yes. You know, um, yeah, and and Tony, of course. But you know, where do you? There are so many great ones. I mean, then Max Roach. I mean, that's another one that. You know, yeah. on and on. But I wanted yeah. to ask you something else because you were, and it's a, this is a funny one because I knew you as a drummer, and of course I have your book, and I, you know, I kept on working out of it. Actually, I just dug it up because I was looking through, and I have like three thousand books. I'm I'm a bookaholic. I I, I eat up everything and on, under the sun in in this world. I have everybody's book. I just love to go through it. But I hadn't seen your book in a very long time. And then I, I remembered I, I had it, so I wanted to dig it up and give you honor to it, having done that. And, and a lot earlier than other people have, which is, which is beautiful. But here's my question. I, yeah. In my mind, you were, you were a drummer, and all of a sudden, the next time I see you after this phase, I hadn't seen you for a long time, professionally speaking. Then we run into you. We run into me and, and my world. 
and you're doing this hip pickles thing with uh, marching drumming and it was it's great and i said wow that's a switch how did that what made you go into that direction rather than drum set player because i knew you as a drum set player and all of a sudden i turn here and you're doing totally something else which is fine beautiful um well as a young person uh i did you know drum core um with my brother lou i played for him for a little over a decade on a drum set um playing with really good players and then um uh, you know, I was doing a lot of teaching, and what I wanted to do was um, influence my students here at my studio here in uh, Uniondale. I wanted to um, give them a little bit of that experience because I knew that they would never participate in any kind of drum corps kind of a thing. So I started the workshop, and that grew into doing a couple of performances and it grew into an ensemble and for 35 years, well, I think it's 36 maybe now. Uh, I don't know how to calculate things with uh, the COVID losing two <laughs> years of COVID, but um, yeah. So um, what, what happened was um, it became something that um as a, as a writer, uh, I found my voice. So my dream was, okay, I, I, I got to bang, I'm desperate. I've got to bang on stuff. Then it became, um, I, this is what I want to do as a career to make money. All right. And then um, it, I just, by accident, uh, it evolved to me um, doing something that I felt more like an artist. And I had this voice that wasn't me on a kit, but I had, uh, well, initially when I started, there was 21 people in the group for, for the first two years. Then it was four people, which was really in the heyday. That's what really put us on the map. And they would, had some really talented people in that group. And um, we really meld um, choreography, drumming, of course, singing, um, humor, uh, and entertaining. You know, we one of the things that we did as a group, we, we uh, performed six years in uh, South Street Seaport in Manhattan. Uh, drove in, no mass transit for me, drove in and, um, learned a lot and that a lot of people don't like drums and you really have to be good to stop people that are in transit somewhere to get them to listen to what you're doing. So we, we really developed some entertainment uh, skills. And what I realized more and more was that my voice was an act. It had to be an act. It wasn't just music making. Now, again, I had some badass performers, young people. I felt like Buddy Rich in a way where I was the old guy and I had these young guys, you know. And, um, and it, it was, um, you know, getting back to um, the idea of, you know, uh, coincidences. Um, so we would play at South Street Seaport and this lady was there with her family. And she comes up to me and says... You know, I'd like to have you come play it at my kid's school. And I go, well, well, what would we do? I didn't even know that, you know, you could do that. Well, I don't know. And it's just, and it pays really well. Whoa. Oh, really? Tell me more, right? So this nice lady, Susan Collins, um, this is maybe in 1990 something. And um, so she mentored me, and we wound up having this business of, doing that um so we started doing some pieces and um i made a video i sent it to ron spagnardi uh publisher of modern drummer magazine for people that don't know and um 
he he loved the video. He had us three times. It was unheard of that people would play even twice. He had us there three times. I saw uh, you there. Performing there. Yes. there. Ralph yeah. Angelia is there. He brings us up to Montreal. We did the Montreal Fest two times, and then then we we did the the the, the, um, the festivals, and all of a sudden companies are going. You know, we'd like you to you know try our products, and if you like them, endorse them or whatever. And we hooked up with, so it's just amazing these coincidences that you speak of all the time. You know, it's really my life. You know, it started with just the, the pure luck of having great parents, loving, wonderful parents, um, having a incredible wife like you. I, I saw the, uh, the video <laughs> that you did with your wife, you know, and I never met her, but it comes through. That she's just a, you know, she's she's like my Chris, but yet different. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. And, it does. Uh, we have so much fun. Yeah, she's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So you and know, it's good. I mean, it's on that on that point. Though, I mean, it's really important. It's really fantastic that we're. I mean, not only are we blessed to be able to do something we love to do, but then coming across somebody as a life partner, and. And she's also a musician. She's a pianist and violinist. And uh, being with someone like that who totally understands you, yeah, yeah, and you're on the same page and you can still laugh, you can still make the jokes, but despite all the stuff you got to deal with on the planet. But it's amazing. And and it's funny, the, the podcast I had, it was, it was just an experiment. And I said, um, I, I think I was just trying something um, and we said, just try. Can you do you mind just sitting out and you know I'd like to interview you on this? And she says, well, sure, sure, why not? <laughs> you know? So yeah. we did it, and and then we said, hey, this, this, is, and I said, let's make it natural. I I don't like to fabricate things. It's got to be. It's got to feel natural. It's got to you know say what you want to say, and you know. And I said, if you want, if whatever you want to say, I'm not going to edit out. So you're, <laughs> it's going to stay. <laughs> and it turned out great. But thank you for watching that, Chet. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but it's nice to have someone with you that on that trail that just makes it interesting every day. Well, you know, to just expand on that, um, I don't think that I would have, well, let me back up. One of the first things I said today was that I am really blessed. And I don't think my life would be such a wonderful journey if I didn't have those basic people in my life, my parents, my brother, and my wife, but all the people you bump into. And... You know, it, it has amazed me how um, people just have come to influence my life. It's just like just getting back to that Modern Drama Festival thing. Not only did all of a sudden we're getting, you know, people bringing up to Toronto, Montreal, you know, uh, England, Austria, whatever, but we also wound up. Um, the, uh, Modern Drummer does a write-up on on the, the, the festival. And there's this really wonderful man, and his name is Jeff Davis, and he's a court writer. He happened to play drums when he was at Syracuse University, and he saw that we would be really good that he could write us into corporate meetings. Now, not not like parties or anything, but actually the meeting. So they would, we would open the the the, uh, the meeting. We would do a um, icebreaker kind of a thing, uh, and then his, his. So we did a lot of corporate work all over the all over the country, and then with that, he um, kind of prodded us to do bring in some world percussion. Now, I'm one of those guys, I'm not going to play hand jumps because I don't want to mess up my hands, right? Um, so what happened was, um, okay, 
this is really important. This is a lot of this kind of work. So, uh, and, and, I, and I didn't want to let this man down. He was really just a wonderful person. So I really got into that. I really, you know, the whole drum circle thing. So I got into facilitating. But that would not have happened if I didn't, this shy guy who doesn't want to even get on mass transit go to Manhattan, um, if, if I hadn't, uh, you know, uh, sent that video to Ron, all this other stuff didn't happen. And throughout my life, that's just like just a minor example. That has happened. And it's just um, it's just been a, a wonderful thing. And um, the other thing is for 35 plus years, you know, Hit Pickles has not stayed the same. You know, as people would leave, you know, I'd have people say nine years, 10 years, whatever. But people would leave and, you know, I would write material that was, um, for that person, because this person had a unique skill set, right? So, um, because of that, you know, it would change, and also to to be able to do different kind of work. You know, one of the things, another thing that came out of the Modern Jumma Fest, I can't believe I'm remembering this, but there was this other guy, uh, Augie Covert, and he was booking sporting events. So we wound up doing major sporting events. We opened the, the Toronto Raptors, the Yankees, uh, all these uh, basketball teams all around the country. They fly us in. And, uh, and what happened was nobody was doing that. And then what happened was people saw that this was a good thing. So these uh, people that were booking us, they said, well, you know what? We'll get some local people to do this. So we that work faded away because other people just started doing it, which is a cool thing. But we were doing it, you know, and and it was just, you know, it was a pretty cool thing. But yeah. uh, as you say, you know, it's all about uh, coincidences. And and I, you know, I there I, are I, no coincidences, right? There are no coincidences. You know, and that's the thing, Chet. I mean, the coincidence is really. You showing up, you are doing that that thing, and by doing that, this happens. It's a decision you made. You could have never mailed that tape. You could have uh, not played that violin. <laughs> you could have, you know, you you could have not done. You know, and I say to people, it's it's important that you want to do something. Well, you have to make a move. You have to uh, put yourself out there. Uh, show you have to show up, and you have to be yeah. part of something in some form. Launch it. And if you just stay home and you do nothing, well, nothing happens. It's it's magic. But if uh, if you do something, something happens. But yeah. it, it's it, and whatever happens is no coincidence. And and when we say Are you're ready for, it? you're always ready for whatever. Uh, just keep looking. You keep walking, and you're on your mission. And all of a sudden, you end up somewhere else just because of a decision. That, that you had to make that, that posed itself. And it was like, a, you know, you go this way or this way. This, the road is here and you don't have the, the maps, but you say, well, I think I'll go this way. Well, you know, it's never a wrong decision. It's a decision that you felt at the moment felt right. If it, it was, if you needed that experience, you got it. Now you get back on track <laughs> to somewhere else, but you're in constant motion and things happen. Um, it's, I, it's like, and it, here's, here's a funny one. I had a student who said, you know, I don't play with anybody. I'm really frustrated. And I said, you're also not practicing. So if you don't get that together, nobody's going to hear of you. Yes. But you know, then the, the, the other response is I'll play and I'll be, be really good, but nobody will know because I will not. Okay. Do me a favor. Let's make a deal that you follow the instructions to the letter, you practice to the letter. And I promise you that if you don't, if you're not playing within two years, I'm gonna give you all your money back with interest. Wow. So what happened? The person said, you're serious. I said, I'm dead serious, dead serious. If you, if you do that, I'm gonna put this in writing if you wish. Otherwise, my word is good. I, my word has always been good. And I'm proud of that. And I'll stick to it. <laughs> Even if I lose my shirt, doesn't matter. So they did, you know, the person did, 
And then all of a sudden, you know, just had forgotten about this because it was kind of a, a joke, but I would have stuck to my word. It was kind of a right. joke. And all of a sudden, the student says, you know, I got a call. A friend of mine asked me to play in this party. And then I got this call and that call. And I said, isn't that funny? I said, so now I don't owe you anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he remembered. Oh, that's true. I said, remember, you did it. So, of course... Now you're a thing. Now you 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 showed up at that party, and you wouldn't have been able, you wouldn't have sat in if you weren't playing. If you didn't have the the chops or the or the maturity, musical maturity, etc. And then that just happened. And I said, it's funny how the phone rings. It's just a miracle. It's a funny coincidence, isn't it? But it's not going to ring if 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 you're not on the other side, and you're not ready to say yes, I do play drums and you know and people know that you're playing you know that has to be circulating has to be up in the air and it's magic it's a coincidence but i don't believe in coincidences it's funny I, one day i'll tell you the story of how yolan and i met what a coincidence that was <laughs> this it was strange but you know another and it's those things that are there and they they happen or not you know i I happened to open the door because I was teaching at McGill at the time as an adjunct. And she was finishing her uh, master's at the time. She did her PhD. But I opened the door and I see this beautiful girl. And I, you know, I said, wow, nice, you know, ni nice looking girl and stuff. So it was there. So I went in and I did a rehearsal because it was a, a big band rehearsal. It was an alumni thing that uh, CBC was recording some uh, well-known pianists. So they got all the people who had graduated to play, to play in the band. And so uh, we were taking a break and I ran into her again and I, and I asked her what time it was. And she looked, she points to the clock on the wall behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then, you know, we spoke and she says, wait a second, aren't you part of that group? A repercussion group, that percussion. So the funny thing is, she had seen that she was a total classical nerd. And I'm studying classical, but I do everything else. And I have like, my, my taste is so open. What I do is so open. But she says, you know, it's a funny thing. I really, it was one of the, the only concerts I've been to that's not classical, classically oriented only. And a percussion group, I happened to be at a camp and I was doing a performance. I needed to take a break. I heard this group repercussion. I said, oh man, I, at least it'll take me out of the, the zone. I saw you guys and I couldn't believe that so much music could come out of four guys playing percussion. Of course, we were playing mallets also and we were playing African drums, like we were doing everything. But she was just mesmerized. And then here's the funny part. Uh, you know, I invited her to the concert and blah, blah, blah. And I, we never left our site. <laughs> Each other said since then. But then the funny thing is, at a second date, she wore the, this dress. And I said, wow, for some strange reason, I remember, I have a vision, a memory of this dress. Said, that's weird. And then she said, oh, my God. She says, that's the dress I wore when I came to see you guys. And I'm standing in the front. And I, who would remember that? And wow. then she says, something even more weird is I was home clearing up my things and I never keep any program. I have never kept a program and I had your program. Wow. <laughs> so I don't believe in coincidences. Things are set up. You either follow through or not. They're set up for you if you're, if you're ready or you don't see it or it's not time. There's no coincidence. What do you think? I mean, everything you've done, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, oftentimes I say, you know, this is the way the book was written. And uh, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm just a character uh, in a play. And I'm, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I have input on, uh, you know, it's like a Ouija board. You know what a Ouija board is? Yes, yes. You know? And you put your hand on it, but there's other people who have their hands on it too. So you have influence, but there's all these other things that move that Ouija board to different directions. So, 
you know, I, I've, I've always felt that, um, that I have input, but uh, things just happen, you know, and, uh, you know, I've, I just, um, you know, just kind of, um, I, I'm very happy about us, you know, talking today, you know, it's been, you know, like a lot of people with the COVID, you know, well, just to back up a little bit, you know, my mom was, um, uh, my mom passed away in September um, at, at the age of 102. And um, for wow. probably the last 15 to 20 years, we've been taking care of my mom and, and Chris's mom is uh, a, a year and just about a year younger than my mom. And uh, so we lost both of them in the last two years. And then COVID shut down, uh, you know, the hip pickles, you know, we're very active um, uh, doing on schools on the East Coast here. And um, that work just totally shut down. And then I wound up, I had had a bad valve in my heart for probably most of my life. And I finally had to get, get that uh, surgery. So I've been out of commission and, and um, I've been in the mode of, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life besides speaking to Aldo? And, um, <laughs> the worst and, things um, can happen. So I'm, in, I'm at this point where this is really cool for me to, 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 to chat with you because, um, you know, um, you know, there's some things I have a lot of passion about right now. You know, uh, me and a friend of mine who's a Vietnam veteran, a uh, real hero, and um, we run this um, drumming for our veterans concert. And uh, we've, we just finished the fifth, the fifth year. We just did it in January. So I'm kind of back in terms of being a producer, sort of like, uh, you know what that's about. It's a lot, a lot of work. Oh, yes. And um uh, you know, and I hope that, um, you know, I think what I'm going to do is work on a solo drum act and, um, you know, like you, you know, I arrived at a point where egotistically you're a performer, you're a player, you love the drums, everything drums, but, but like you, and what I respect about you is that you make a difference. You know, you take music and drumming and everything and you impact on other people's lives. And what I have found and kind of backed into it back at the South Street, Sea South Street Seaport in 96, somewhere around there, when this lady was there with her family, that not only was it lucrative to, to perform in schools for us, but we were making a difference with our met messaging. We were going Dang. into schools talking about anti-bullying. We, we were talk, and we the music was like the connector. Sure. You know, we I wrote tunes. You know that we sang. Uh, we had kids come up, and we were exciting them about being involved in the arts. We'd get them dancing. We would get them playing on our musical instruments. Yeah. So we were growing people that, wow, this is really cool to perform. So, you know, like you, um, you know, and this is why I, why I love you so much because you're not only a great, great artist and, and just a quick tangent, you know, the idea the way you have your own creative drum set that <laughs> is, it's you, you're genuine. It's it's art. You are an artist. So I respect that part of you. But the idea that you make a difference in people's lives in terms of, ex, you know, exposing them to, you know, different drumming and message through, you know, COSA. I mean, you know, bringing the world together. I mean, it's just, you know, my bottom and, and in my way, I mean, we're the same, but different. But in my way. You know, it's like I'm blessed that I have this this guy, Jack Stein, and Chris is involved and Jack's wife. And, you know, and that, that's the team. You know, we're doing all the work. And we have people come from – this year we have people from 10 states here in America. And um, 
everybody, no one gets paid. We don't get, you know, we get the hall for free. We get this huge, beautiful hall and uh, people come on their own dime and we have like a hundred. So it's like forever. And we have to orchestrate it where everybody gets like um, two minutes to three minutes to play, you know, and then boom, someone else is up on a stage. So it's, it's really a, a, a pretty cool thing. So at this point, you know, it's really special to talk to you today because, you know, I'm at this point where what do I want to do with the rest of my life? I know I'm going to do the veterans thing. Um, I think I'm going to go back into the schools. And as an artist, uh, not like you, uh, you know, in my own way, be a drum set artist. You know, not with a band, you know, maybe doing something with electronics, tracks, maybe uh, triggering things, um, you know, and, um, you know, I think that that's that's what I, I'm going to do. Yeah, no, no, it's it's, and I, I, I have to thank you for all the uh, compliments you're throwing my way. I, I, I really appreciate that because <clears throat> I, I, I really do. You're an think amazing it's... person. <clears throat> oh, now, you're, now you're choking me up. Hold on. <laughs> it's the truth. Thank you, Chet. I, for me, it's just I've been given such opportunities, and of course, you, I worked for for it and stuff. But I am I'm so fortunate. I I always believe what a gift, and also to to have wide eyes and understand it. And and you know, of course, you take on the work. And when you see things, and I tell my students, when you see things, do them and and be part of something bigger than you. And if you you know it's like the the Italian meal you you come to bring something to the table you don't come empty-handed and make the situation better don't take away from the situation and you can only help others if you are if you have something to offer and never take you always give and, and you always give and, and and always be part of somebody else's success and you can only be part of somebody else's success is if you have something to say and it should never be a negative and then you'll always you'll always have everything you need. Food will always be on the table. You'll always have what, what you need. If you want more, well, you know that's your decision. I mean, if you need three cars, well, <laughs> you know <laughs> that, that's your that's your problem. Um, but just being part of something that just grows, that it's just moving forward, and you know all the great people then that you meet. But you have to show up. You know you can't just wait for things to happen. You have to go and 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 do something that that's worthwhile that's fun and then always the challenge and i think part of it is always the fear of, uh, of, of not not the fear of failing the fear of um wasting yourself wasting time right? you know and doing and 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 because you're able to do something you say okay what would happen if i did this if something happens and it doesn't work out well you just do do it differently or do something else, but standing still is it should never be an option, and you should always be part of the if some somebody needs something, you're always there. You're and you're moving, and everybody helps everybody out. Everybody brings in a piece of bread, a, a fruit, a, you know, a thing. And when that's the case, it, it just makes every situation better. Somebody calls you and say, "Hey, do you have so and so and so's number? I got this idea," and you know, you're the person who can help. Here, take this number, call, uh, opening doors. Uh, how many people have done that for you? Always, always. And if you're a good person with great, good intention, and I think that's important, the intention. You know, if your intention is always good and honorable, you cannot lose. <laughs> you know, you might lose uh, uh, your shoes. You can always get new shoes. Uh, you know, a shirt, you can always get a shirt. But this... Who who you are is in there, and what you what you represent, and what what you wish for, you know, it's like it's basic in in, in my book. And then doing these things and being crazy enough, having the uh, the belief and the guts. But you know, if you believe something, it is. If you want to play like you play, you did this whole hip pickles thing and this whole drumming thing. You won the the drum corps Hall of Fame award. That just didn't happen out of the blue, you did something for it, right? And it's, it's nice. I'm proud of that. Thank you. Yeah. 
you know, and it, and it's and it's you. You hit him. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, it's you. It's something you did, and then you move on. It's another satisfaction that people honor you and people uh, respect you, and they they say, you know, this beautiful. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's a great thing. You know, you hit upon something in in what you just said. You said a lot, um, but you know. I think it's important to note that that failure is um, an important thing. You know, and I can Absolutely. tell you that I've fallen down a lot, failed a lot, um, said, OK, I'm going to do this, whatever. And it doesn't work out or whatever. And um, but in true to to form, as far as what you say, it's a learning experience when that happens. You know, so failing you know, there was a, I don't know the title of the book, but Dick Clark, you know, the American Bandstand. I don't know if you got that up. And, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. He wrote a book and it was, every chapter was a failure in his life. And the last chapter, he tied in what he learned from all those fa failures. It was just a great concept for a book. <laughs> I mean, I think any of us could have written that book. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I failed doing this, I failed doing this. And, and then at the end, he just tied it all together. It was just an incredible um, read, to say the least. But it's, it's true, you know, it's like, and sometimes, you know, we don't, maybe we don't really stop and think enough about that, you know? Sure. And, and so... You know, when you get an award and stuff, you know, it's like, it, it's a really nice thing. But in a way, you know, it's like, you know, you're who you are. I am who I am. And it's nice if somebody acknowledges, oh, that's Aldo. You know, oh, that's Chet. Yeah. But it's, it's, imp it's important. Not just nice. It's important, but you know, it's I mean, not. You and yeah. I, we're on to the next thing, right? Or which, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, and. But it's nice that you know somebody appreciates that, and, and so you sleep well at night. You know, you then you can go out to your next thing, whether it's a learning experience called fail, or uh, you finally did this right. But you, nothing stops there. We we have never, uh, you've never arrived, and you know the day one arrives, then you have to start asking yourself some serious questions. How could it be that you've arrived? Like how could how could that be? <laughs> You know, uh, and but, and it's it's nice that anyway. And that I am proud and honored that someone would think enough of me to place me, you know, to give me that that uh, accolade. You know, yeah. so I don't mean to say that I'm not you know humbled by that, but you know, it's like you know, I, I'm just I'm just another person that just I love the bang on stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely, and that's that's incredible. That yeah. uh, yes, and from the beginning, when that when that starts, I mean, I remember I felt so guilty playing on things. I I ruined my my parents' couch playing on the on the side of the thing to records because I did, we didn't have a drum set in the beginning, and uh, they had that couch for a long time. My mother put a cover on on that set, so the day I could afford to buy. A, you know, new couch. I just uh, had it delivered because <laughs> I, I said, wow. I can't believe they never, they, you know, they let me do that. And I totally ruined that couch, you know, wow. and I had it and you know, I had to take care of that. Car. But that is, that is a beautiful thing. I didn't buy my folks a car though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I, it was one of those I, things I, you just had to do. You know, your parents are the people who are, feed you the most, not only in, in more ways than one, but they're the one who encourage you. And then the ones that go, Oh my God, no. And I yeah. had long hair down to here and they never, in those days you couldn't have hair down to there, but I was an A student. I would, I would never got into trouble, but I had hair down to here. And so if the principal at the school would say, uh, Mr. Matza, your son can't walk around. He says, yes, but is he not the head boy? Is he not doing this? I'm afraid if I have, uh, ask him or, or, or impose that he cuts his hair and his behavior changes, his grades change and all of that, then what do I do? Would you yeah. take responsibility for that? Because I, I'm kind of stuck, you know? And so they stopped asking me to cut my hair 
and everybody was good. Imagine. <laughs> so we all we owe a lot to those guys. <laughs> you know? yeah. But I mean, it's nice to be able to to have the freedom, and 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 we should all understand that we make those decisions in our in our lives that just carve out. You know what we not only for us but all, anybody around us who who influences us, and if it's a uh, and if you're part of the positive side, you can't lose in the end. You cannot lose, and and you have that satisfaction of of being part of a great uh, the great good. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who cares what everybody else does? This is important culture, music. And you can go anywhere on the planet, chat. I mean, you can, you can go land anywhere. They can drop you anywhere and you've got your sticks. Or even if not, you can play with somebody and you don't even have to open your mouth. Don't have to say a word. They understand. Isn't that great? Yeah. Anyway, but, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's nice that, uh, you know, we're able to have this conversation and share a, uh, you know, we all have things that we've done and we keep doing, and we're far from from the finish line. That's for sure. I mean, the finish line. I mean, when the lights are out, well, <laughs> that's that's it. But until until such time, we have stuff to do and stuff to share. And you know, I I think you know we're all thankful for what what there is. You know, what there isn't. Well, you know, we we take care of what we need to do, right? And I thank you for for being part of uh, for part of the show, the conversation, and and as I always say, to be continued. <laughs>